another thing is just using healthy coping strategies so mm. like the basics but like getting them right is important so like getting enough sleep i think a lot of people don't sleep enough um eating healthy food outdoor exercise has a huge number of stress and anxiety relieving properties um or using an app like mindset that can help teach you those coping skills that can help you manage and feel better Hi, I'm Renata Bernardi, and this is the Job Hunting Podcast, where I interview experts and professionals and discuss issues that are important for job hunters and those who are working to advance their careers. So make sure that you subscribe and follow, and let's dive right in. Alex, thanks for your patience waiting for um, our guests to come in. No so, worries. Hello, everybody. For those who are going to be listening to this later, my name is Renata Bernardi, and this is the Job Hunting Podcast. This podcast does what it says on the tin. Um, together with some awesome guests, I help you get your next job and have the career that you want. Today, we're recording live for the very first time here in Melbourne during the Victorian 2020 Digital Innovation Festival, or as we call it, DIFF. DIFF is an initiative of the Departments of Jobs, Precincts and Regions. Precincts, for jo those who are listening overseas, and I do have listeners in over 50 countries, Precincts here in Australia, folks, um, is our innovation hubs, okay? It's not our jails. I once had to explain this to a tech Indian um, delegation. <laughs> After a few aw awful odd meetings, um, I had to explain to them I was not talking about jails. I was talking about innovation. And I never had the opportunity to give that feedback to my colleagues in government. So I'm glad that Kelly Hutchinson, who organizes DIFF, is, <laughs> is attending today. So Kelly, now you know. If you ever have an international delegation, make sure that you explain to them what precincts actually means to Victorians. We're very proud of our innovation precincts in Victoria, especially the health ones. And we will be discussing that in more detail with our guest today. If this is the type of content for you, and if you're currently on the market looking for a job or you're just keen to advance your career, have career, great career plans, make sure that you subscribe by clicking on the subscribe button wherever you have found us on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Podcast, Amazon, wherever else you found us. Um, I'm happy you found us. Um, make sure that you, we are uh, your favorite podcast and you subscribe. Also, please do share the love and share this podcast with someone you believe will benefit from listening. Each episode includes show notes, which are really long blogs. In fact, I love writing with all the links that are mentioned and information on where to find me and how to work with me in case you are looking for a career coach or you're interested in checking out my career coaching services and products. My goal is to follow mindset steps, you know, the... <laughs> um, guests that I'm interviewing here today, but for career coaching. I want to make career coaching accessible, downloadable, easy to um, and effective to uh, work for you. And I wanted to make it really affordable. So to be always updated on my services and new products, which I'll be launching in the couple of months, uh, the best way is to sign up for my newsletter and we will have those links in there already in the show notes if you're listening and they are also if you're live now here today, they are in the chat box so check them out. I'd like to thank everybody that attended today. We have one fifth of the people that have registered. The others will be hopefully waiting to get the recording later on. Okay, that's enough about us, the podcast, and the admin of this recording. Now let's talk about Alex. Alex Namidis is the co-founder and CEO of Mindset Health, a startup founded here in Melbourne, Australia, which now has two apps on the market, Mindset for mental health and Nerva for irritable bowel syndrome, which is often triggered by stress and anxiety. Mindset Health is a company brand with a vision on managing multiple products addressing chronic conditions with app-based hypnotherapy. We will include the links in, to the company and the app websites to the episode show notes, as I said before. 
Since its inception, Mindset has been building a loyal following of fans, including myself, has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, TechCrunch, and other new out news outlets interested in their digital health innovation and hypnotherapy programs. It has also attracted the interest of investors. In May this year, it, it raised $1.1 million in funding from investors across the U.S. and Australia. The first half of our conversation today will be about the startup world, how Alex landed in this world of innovation and entrepreneurialism, about working in startups and building a team of diverse professionals. Then we will focus on the well-being factor, especially now during COVID times, pandemic and lockdown. And, you know, what are the next steps for Mindset Health and its growth, considering all of the things that we have um, experienced in 2020. Okay, so <laughs> that's it from me. Hi there, Alex. Hi, how's it going? I'm good. How are you? I'm going well, thank you. Nice to, nice to be here. Nice to meet you too. You know, we've met before. You won't remember this. Uh, but I used to work for Ken Sloan at Monash Uni when you went through the incubator. Right, yeah, the generator um, program. And did you see it? Like, did we, so we, did we chat or did you just watch us pitch? No, I chatted and I fanned clubbed on you like pretty <laughs> hard. Like, I'm like, oh, I really love this. And then I went home and I downloaded it on the, like the free trial because it was the, um, I went to that presentation that you guys did. Mm -hmm. And then that hooked me and I, I just loved it. I still do. I use it like every week. Oh, awesome. That's, that's great to hear. Thank I you. know, I do. And I, uh, on the podcast, a couple of times I've mentioned it because people that are in between jobs go through a lot, you know, if they've been made redundant or got terminated or whatever. It's really, it's hard. It makes you really anxious. And, you know, the financial issues, the family. Everything. Yeah, that's, that's understandable. But I've used it to lose weight. <laughs> everything. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about how you, are you working from home? Uh, yeah. At the moment, yeah. So at the mm -hmm. moment, like Chris and I actually live together as well. Um, mm -hmm. So we, I, I work from my bedroom and Chris works downstairs. Yeah. Um, but before that we were we just moved into an office um that we leased in our first office and then the shutdown happened <laughs> so it's, it's a bit frustrating that we can't um work uh, from there but where yeah, is it um in Cremorne so like two minute walk from Richmond station nice oh that's so trendy mm. tell me a little bit tell us all how you came about to become this startup entrepreneur what happened yeah, so uh, I actually started Mindset with uh, my brother, Chris. Um, we've always been, I guess, entrepreneurial, but always trying to make money and solve problems, probably driven through our dad, who also is an entrepreneur and um, dinner, late night dinner chats around um, business and fundraise and all of that probably influenced it. But when we were 15, we were making apps for like uh, copy apps that were just essentially web views that linked to Facebook and eBay, but Facebook and branded at Facebook for tablets. Um, and we made thousands of dollars before we were shut down for breaching um, privacy and, and, and breaching uh, copyright, sorry. Um, but since then, we actually started working on a, a previous app called Covet, which was a peer-to-peer -peer dress rental app. Um, but before that, like, we identified a problem that uh, women had a lot of clothes but weren't, uh, couldn't wear them due to social media, um, but we didn't know how to code. Um, and we knew that like, to build a digital business that we wanted to build, um, we needed to be able to operate fast and iterate and we didn't have any money because we were um, at that time 20 and or 21 and 19. And so we spent uni break uh, locked in our basement, teaching ourselves to code from a $15 Udemy course um, and then actually built it. So we, we'd spent like six months building this, this massive dress rental app, um, well, fixing all these problems that we didn't know because we're not women. Um, and then went through the, the generator, the Monash um, accelerator program. Um, but halfway through, uh, Kish, who ran the program, asked us, do, do you want to work on a dress rental app for the next 10 years? And we didn't. We didn't want to work on it. It wasn't passionate. It wasn't working out. Um, it wasn't interesting to us. And so we killed it. But we sort of fell 
into this period of like self doubt and anxiety, um, which made us look like in look inwards about mental health and um, these automatic thoughts and like how you can train them and like met, put us on a journey to explore different types of ther therapy. Um, we came across hypnosis um, through a podcast actually um, called Science vs Hypnosis, and there was like a, a surprising amount of evidence um, behind it as a, a therapeutic tool. Um, and we're like, oh, that, that's super interesting. There's, there's so much stigma around it, so many misconceptions, but turns out there's a whole heap of evidence supporting it. Um, and it, it gave us an idea. Like we just learned how to build apps. Could we use that new skill set um, to take hypnosis into the mainstream? Is, it was our, essentially our original thought and do what Headspace and Calm had done for meditation and bring something that was a little bit woohoo and meditation was like a woohoo science for hippies. Um, and now it's like a massive global phenomena that everyone is doing. Um, and that's, so that triggered our first idea. And so we built mindset for mental health off the back of that, which is essentially it's um, helping people learn uh, coping skills through focused attention and absorption, which is hypnosis. Um, and then we went through uh, the Startmate program in May 2018, which is another accelerator program, um, which really helped us like upskill and drive and, and grow our, our business. And then in 2019, we went through Y Combinator. And so that, that's a global startup accelerator with alumni like Airbnb, Stripe, Dropbox, Reddit, all started through that program. And that's when we launched our second program, which is Nerva. Along that journey, we realized that where um, hypnotherapy is really powerful is in less of a broad wellness product like mindset, which is still um, now we're more focusing on the mental health side, but in specific conditions, um, specific mind-body conditions. And so we launched Nerva for IBS, um, which is a, a massive condition, affects 15% of the population. But turns out hypnotherapy is um, just as effective as the gold standard elimination diet, um, low FODMAP but doesn't require you to change what you eat. And so we worked with a researcher from Monash University to take her research and similar to what you're talking about, making something more accessible. And, but she can only see a certain amount of people um, and make it more accessible, make it like help thousands, tens of thousands, millions of people across the world. That's amazing. Hypnotherapy is like another level, you know, to the wellbeing apps, isn't it? Have we're going to talk about that later. I'm really excited to, to hear um, the response that you get when you walk into, you know, a, a room full of VCs and say, oh, we have a hypnotherapy app. Uh, but what do you think were, are your strengths as a leader and as a professional that led you to pursue this career as an entrepreneur? Because it, it's tough, isn't it? Yeah. So I think, I think like the, the the primary one is just having a growth mindset. Like we know we're pretty young. We don't like, we're not farmer executives or not doctors. And so we have to like, just learn as much as we can. And I think knowing that we can grow and knowing that we can just learn fast is a, like an, a massive advantage because we, we can move faster and learn more and approach problems in a different way from first principles than existing incumbents who think this is the way things are done. But because we, we come from a fresh fresh set of eyes and always looking for learning and um it means we can sort of find unique solutions that no one has ever thought of another i think another skill that we have is just thinking big um we like it's quite uncommon in australia to think like there's like tall poppy syndrome and thinking small and thinking australia only like we were global from day one we were looking for let's build a billion dollar business let's build the what at the, at the initially it was headspace for hypnosis and that's a billion dollar business but now we're looking let's build the over-the-counter um app-based therapy for pfizer um and be a multi-billion dollar business and i think like having that thinking big attracts um investors and attracts employees and and that that has been something um that i think is quite valuable uh and i, I think another one is just persistence like we, we applied for the generator and we got in first, but we were the first application. But for the start, maybe we applied twice before we got in. For Y Combinator, it took us three times. We flew over for a 10-minute interview and got rejected um, to San Francisco, sorry. And, but that persistence of keep trying and when things fail, um, I think is like a key part of making success. Because no one knows. And like if you get knocked down for the first time and you don't get up, then like you might have missed out on a massive opportunity. And Alex, I think, I think this... Um, I don't know how long you've been a leader of people, but now you have a team. 
How, yeah. how has it changed having people working with you and for you? It's, it's really changed and it, it's super exciting. But like for most of the our journey, like for two years, it was just Chris and I like working on it. And like with my brother and like we have a way of communication. We were document, documenting things. We just like communicated um, through, it, through our minds, um, <laughs> and which, was, which is great and fun. But like we were handicapped at how much we could do personally. And now we've got a team um, of 10 people. Um, some part-time, but it, it sort of has changed how we operate and what the sort of work we do, but also leverage that. And so we can just move so much faster and accomplish so much more things, but it has provided a new, like a new set of hurdles around like, okay, we, we've had us worked in a certain way of not documenting things and um, not having like historical evidence to look back to. But now we have a team that require documentation to communicate with each other. And it has all those, like, especially now in COVID, like doing it remotely and trying to set up those meetings and set up like routines for the company and information sharing. And I think something we have struggled in the past and then getting better at is context sharing. So we, we're across everything in the business, but it's hard to like then remember that some people only have a certain slice of information and then so our, our responsibility as leaders is to communicate the context needed to make proper decisions and accurate decisions. Um, and I think we're getting better at that as well as documenting processes. How do you choose people to work with you? I, I had a business when I was your age. I mean, I don't know how old you are, but I had you know, my first business. I was in my 20s. And as I was growing, I remember thinking, oh, I can't wait to grow just a little bit more so I can afford you. <laughs> so I used to kind of, you know, keep hoping I was growing enough to actually bring the people that I wanted to work with me. And I never actually advertised roles. I just, you know, as soon as I could afford, I would find people and, and bring them on board. Or would you, are, are the skills so specific that you have to advertise to find the right people for the roles? So I think the... The primary way um, for an early stage startup to hire people is through referrals. It's through your own network. It's through who you know and who your new teammates know. Um, and, and ideally, that's what we would do. Um, just because Chris and I aren't technical and we didn't um, study computer science, um, for, especially for those sort of roles, we, we did need to advertise or at least go through our external network. Um, but because we, we came from a place of once we raised, we had raised our, um, it was 1.1 mil US, so like 1.7 Australian. Um, we, we could hire everyone we wanted, but we wanted to, um, it gave us an, a point where like, we wanted to take the time to hire the right people. Like this is a marriage, um, like the, the first like five, 10 people that you hire set the culture for the entire organization. If we get to 200 people. And so we wanted to make sure we made the right decisions and hired the right people, um, at the right time. And so I think that it's, it's sometimes that it's easy when you raise money to then spend money and spend it fast on the wrong people or too, hiring too many people before they're needed and then run out of money and burn and then have to lay people off. And especially when during this time, you, you want to be in a safe mm -hmm. position. And I think something we've done well is to spend the time to look for the right people at the right time and then um, get them. Have you and Chris have the like similar leadership styles? Are you complementary or very different from each other? Uh, we're probably, um, similar in some ways and then complimentary as well. Um, Chris is probably more of a, like a patient leader, which is something I need to learn as well. Um, I get like frustrated getting distracted sometimes and, but I think we're like, we definitely compliment. I sometimes can be more of like thinking big and Chris is more like good organizational stuff. And so complimenting each other in that way, like has been really, really good. And having like, obviously being brothers means we can operate in a, like a, a certain way that other co-founding teams just can't. That's amazing. I was, that, that, that's what I was thinking. I was thinking, wow, how, how can they, you know, work on this together? That's excellent. And I, um, I, I wanted to ask you something that um, I get asked all the time and I, I help um, clients all the time with clients that have worked in the corporate environment, like the traditional bricks and mortar corporate um, public environment, but are super keen to work for startups. You know, there's this romantic idea uh, that it's cool to work for startups or they really want to have a second career and, you know, a different um, experience. Some of them have made a very successful transition. I'm happy to say that I have helped a few others, uh, not so much. So what do you think, have you experienced um, or do you have in your team people that have come from a more traditional sector and are now working for you? 
Yeah, so I think there's there's a lot of value in bringing people with like ex- experience in a certain thing. Like, um, and we have people who have come from bigger organizations and their processes they can bring and their experience has really leveled us up. But I think it's important for them as well. Like they come into a business that is like, 10 people instead of a thousand people, 500 people. And, and things are going to be different. We're going to, we move much faster. We aim for 80% instead of a hundred percent quality. Like we, we get, um, and so we need to sort of take back some of that. Like there's a middle ground of bringing some of that um, expertise and that process is without like slowing us down. Cause our advantage as a startup is we move quickly and um, people have lots of responsibility. And I think that's another, another thing as well. Like when you're in a big organization, you, you have like a certain role and this is your skill set and this is the things you do because there's so many people. But in a startup, like we have 10 people, you wear many hats and you might be doing things that you're uncomfortable with. You might be spread thin across multiple different areas and it, it could take time to, to learn that. Um, but if you're aware of that coming in and, and you're like willing to learn, and I think that that's part of like our, one of our values is this growth mindset of learning and being like no one's an expert at everything at the start, but willing to like, like learn it and get your your hands dirty i think it's important there's mm-hmm. programs as well that are helpful um to start make fellowship so start make is the accelerator program that we went through but they have another thing called the fellowship which they take a cohort of 30 people from like mckinsey and big organizations and who people like you were talking about and then help like settle them into startups um so we had a fellow working with us um who's now worked um who now works at eucalyptus another australian startup and so yeah. it, it's like a quite a like valuable experience i would say you're right now i need to find out when those um opportunities are open to let my clients know Uh, thanks for reminding me okay now let's talk about your app so i i used to fly to san francisco a lot i used to have family there my cousin just moved out in fact (laughs) san francisco during covid is not a good place to be (laughs) but (laughs) i also lived there when i was younger and when I think about your offering for that Silicon Valley crowd, it's just the thing, you know, like the, the thing I love the most in San Francisco is just sitting in the coffee and just listen to other people talking about, you know, all the sort of funky things they're coming up with. And an app about hypnotherapy is just the thing that I think suits that environment so well. How was it perceived here in Australia, though? Because I think Australians, as you said, have like the tall poppy syndrome, but they're much more averse to sort of what they would consider woo-woo things. Are you agreeing with me or you think I'm I'm being too pessimistic about my Australian fellows? Uh, I would say, yeah, it's it's more, I don't know if it's woo-woo necessarily. It would... It's not the, because it's, more... it works. No, no, sorry, I don't mean even that. I mean, like, as in they're more risk averse and maybe like, so like something great about San Francisco and great about the Bay area as well is just that like they look towards the future. And so like one man's woohoo is one man's like cutting edge. And so like they're more open to new experiences, I would say in that way. Um, More of the the, the difference in the investor perspective is that Australians are much more um, like metric focused early on um, and much more about like, we need to know the numbers, like essentially risk averse, trying to de-risk their investment from the get-go. But mm-hmm. in the US, it's much more about like, think big. Is there a chance that this company is going to be a billion dollar company? Um, and then like, okay, if that's the case, let's like invest. Um, and so seeing uh, like in a seed stage company, that that sort of like visionary thinking is is something we we really value as investors. And I think we got more of that in, in the US. But that doesn't say that there's, investors in Australia there's definitely yeah. investors that think that way um, a lot of great VCs that think that way um, but I think generally that's the case um, and just like macroly like I, I looked at a stat recently there's three dollars something um, per capita in in angel um, funding but in Australia sorry in the US it's twenty five dollars per capita so there's yeah. just a lot more capital available in the states which means that you, there's more competition on the investor side to get into deals and so um, seeing that heat up can make it easier to raise money there. What about downloads? Where is your, where are your apps more successful? Um, I would say what the, we have around 30 to 40% of our um, users in the States, okay. um, another 30 to uh, 40% or maybe 30% in the UK and then 30% in Australia. Um, okay. So like it, Australia is like overrepresented, but the US is our biggest market. That's pretty m- 
No, no. Well, our podcast is 40% US and then 20% Australia, which is ridiculous. I thought it was going to be way more Australia than US. And then the rest of the world is like the rest. 10%. But it's funny, isn't it? Because mm. I find the um, content so Aussie of what we're talking about. Not today, but most of the time. Um, so let's talk about hypnotherapy. And how can, you, how can you work hypnotherapy via an app? How was that? Yep. How did you enable that to happen? So essentially, all hypnotherapy is, is hypnosis plus therapeutic techniques. Um, hypnosis isn't a therapy. Um, it, it's essentially um, focused attention, absorption, and relaxation that help you become more um, receptive to new ideas and um, perspectives. And so when you couple that with therapeutic te techniques like visualization, um, learning coping skills, CBT, it actually amplifies, um, amplifies those therapies. And the, the mode of delivery is actually quite similar to what you would see with an app like Headspace. It's guided audio sessions where you shut your eyes, the, the hypnotherapist bring, uh, helps guide you into a state of focused and relaxed attention and then goes through visualizations or, as I was saying, teaching you coping mechanisms and techniques and skills um, while you're in this relaxed um, state. And then they just wake you up. So it's very similar if you think of like an app like Headspace or Calm, um, how that operates, but it's much more structured, much more about what the hypnotherapist is saying versus looking inward onto yourself and self-reflecting. -reflect yeah, I, it's really funny. I, I use it a lot to sleep uh, because I've done all the programs that I could do. You know, I don't need to stop smoking, so I haven't done that, <laughs> that bit of your app. Um, and most of the time I sleep before it ends, but sometimes I listen to it until the end and then I get really upset. Oh, it didn't work this time. And then a second later, I'm asleep. <laughs> it's, you know, it always works, but I have this feeling, oh no, it's not going to work. It's, it's ending and I haven't yet fallen asleep. And then as soon as I think that, I'm asleep. <laughs> so I know it works. Um, so it's been very well received. And that was before COVID. Has COVID changed your um, uh, future, you know, for this app and for digital health in general? So, like, on an app level, we've seen it's sort of a mixed bag where for current users, there's an increase in usage. So, for obviously, for mindset, for mental health, and for IBS, um, where triggered by stress and anxiety, there's an increase in usage, but for, because um, it's needed, but for actually, because buy, buyer spending and um, has decreased, we found it maybe a little bit more difficult to acquire users um, cost, like, cost effectively. And so we've probably seen like leveled out and it's not being positive or negative to us. Um, but I'm gonna, on a macro level, the changes that COVID are bringing to regulation and to thinking around digital health products I think is pushing us forward. Um, and you can see that around uh, al like allowing telemedicine to be covered by Medicare in Australia and in the States, um, that, that sort of regulatory push is something that we think is going to be really helpful down the line as we try to get reimbursement. And so I think on that level, it's been really beneficial. So in the US, you can get reimbursement from downloading For the app? Not for the app, but for telemedicine. So it's oh, still a step okay. like where you say you, you see a, um, a therapist on Zoom. Um, you can get that reimbursed now in Medicare in Australia and in the, in the States. Um, but that's just one step forward towards like the end goal of our um, products being reimbursed by health insurers. Okay. So what are, you know, you, you've this announcement of the investment that um, funds made on the app was very recent. It was May. Um, I'm assuming some of that COVID pandemic and the situation kind of played also in the minds of your investors, would you say? So we actually raised the, um, the, the, the round at the end of last year. So it probably oh, didn't okay. have an effect. Okay. We just announced it then um, because... Yeah, just took that time and we thought that was the valuable time when we want to start hiring to give us um, give, give us leverage. Um, 
but yeah, so it didn't have an impact, but it definitely was super lucky. So we were the, we graduated from Y Combinator um, the end of last year, raised our seed round and then COVID happened. And there's definitely been an impact to um, the funding landscape. Um, but I think if you like macro at a macro level, VCs have already raised their funds. They have a lot of money, dry, dry powder to spend. They're going to have to spend it. You just might see larger rounds in fewer companies. Okay. And with, um, so you're saying that the users that have your app are using it more often, but it's harder to get new users because of the cost and people are being careful with funding and sorry, with money. What are you and mindset are going to do to continue to grow during recession? So for, with mindset, we actually made it, we made it free during April um, and then we're now offering the monthly subscription at a discount and annual at a discount. Um, for Nerva, it's about finding that that right price point. And it's interesting. Um, you can see in Google Trends with IBS, the search decreased um, during like the peak of COVID. It's now recovered a little bit. Um, our our thesis is that in times of acute crisis, chronic conditions take a back seat, and so. Potentially, it, it was a mix of buyer, buyer spending, um, consumer spending, but also just a decrease in their focus. So, but during a recession, um, their condition still might flare up again. Um, it, their COVID is less of an impact. And so their focus is back onto their condition and they might w be willing to spend that, that mm -hmm. amount of money. But long term, it's getting reimbursement. So, well, my during, sample is much smaller than yours, but, you know, I have a lot of girlfriends. Girlfriends have IBS and my girlfriends have all had their IBSs all have flared up during COVID. Mm. <laughs> so maybe there are other bigger priorities like kids at home and, you know, homeschooling and loss of jobs. So the searches are different, but they're still struggling. So when I'm on the phone with them, they're still complaining about their IBS. Yeah, and exactly. I would, I would say 50% of my girlfriends have IBS. Really? Wow. Mm. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's like a huge, um, it's overrepresented. Women, myself men, included. Suffer from it. Yeah, myself included. So I've, I've had FODMAP for since 2012, I think, I've, that I followed FODMAP. So maybe I need to download Nervous. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, like, if you found success with FODMAP, then maybe you don't need to. But it's for people who might not want to have to follow an elimination diet. Um, oh, I don't. I like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Give me back my ice cream. I want to eat watermelon. <laughs> you know, it's all the mixing up that the FODMAP doesn't allow you to do. You know, you can't have beans and then eat watermelon. But I want to, you know... Combine those two. Your beans and watermelon meals. <laughs> so I might need to download Nervous so I can eat whatever I want. Um, okay. And tell me about, so people that are listening as well would probably want to get some of your thinking and ideas about managing well-being. I mean, how do you, how do you, you found this through your own journey and discovery of hypnotherapy to help you during a time when you had anxiety. Job hunters and people that are in what we call frictional unemployment in between jobs um, usually feel very anxious about being in between jobs. I'd love to hear, you know, because I'm assuming you're always reading and learning and talking to professionals that are experts in managing anxiety. What, would your tips be and how they can manage it themselves? Yeah. And I think like that, especially during COVID, um, I, a lot of people are suffering from like mental health issues, anxiety, um, depression, or like just stress in general. And there's like, there's a few ways that you can deal with it. First of all, like you see a mental health professional. There's um, the government gives you 10 free sessions that you can see, see someone. Um, if you're going to see your GP and get going. That's in Australia, by the way, folks, but yes. Oh, oh, in okay. Australia, sorry. Um, <laughs> in Australia. But, and also there's now an extra 10. So if you've already gone to a, um, a mental health professional and you've already used up that first 10, that they've given you another 10 as well. So that, that's a first step. Um, and you but, can do that online these days. You can do that via Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. 
another another step is like something I do myself is I consume a lot of content, especially news content, and that can help increase the level of stress. Like seeing how many things are going wrong in the world, things out of your control, it really like like can make you anxious. And so avoid like if you can avoid leaning into that and focus yeah. on like only consuming content that helps you practically and gives you skills that you need. Maybe it's um, watching Dan Andrew, our premier's thing to help you know what you need to do today, but not seeing it every day um, when it doesn't actually change your life every day. Um, another thing is, is using healthy coping strategies. So mm. like the basics, but like getting them right is important. So like getting enough sleep, I think a lot of people don't sleep enough, um, eating healthy food, outdoor exercise has a huge number of stress and anxiety relieving properties um, or using an app like mindset that can help teaching you those coping skills that can help you manage and feel better. Um, something as well, especially with working from home for a lot of people who are in lockdown now is trying to keep up a daily routine. So I know, especially for me, I'm working from my bedroom. Um, it's hard. It's hard when those like work life balances cross over so, so easily. So, keeping a daily routine of waking up at the same time, um, going to work at the same time, eating at the same time. Um, science has shown that routines can actually help you feel less stressed because you're not always um, constantly uncertain about what's happening and, and it's much more familiar. So I recommend doing that while you're working at home. Um, and then just like staying connected, like especially during lockdown when you're like only seeing the people in your house and you're not seeing your family and friends in person, like they're your traditional support network when you would normally be stressed. And so it can be even harder when you don't have access to them. And so using things like Zoom, like, like FaceTime, like something I do with my family is like every Sunday we do Scriblio, like online um a drawing game with my parents and like my, my family and like so staying connected in digital ways can help a, go a long way to replicating that existing social support system that you might have relied on in normal times yeah you're right um i i have found when i moved to australia um that people here are not as comfortable going to see a mental health professional as um in my home country so um it it depending on where you live, um, you might feel more comfortable uh, going to see a mental health practitioner. And unfortunately, I think that plays a role, but there is so much um, incentive in Australia to really push people out of their comfort zone. And ha being someone who has done therapy for a few years, it's so good <laughs> it's wonderful and more than those 10 first sessions plus the additional 10 sessions anything that you do on a routine you know all of those things that you mentioned before not just doing it one off but doing it routinely building a routine around it i think that's where re the real benefit comes from is to incorporate things on your day-to-day -day, um life so whenever I, I use the mindset app, for example. I try to do the whole program because, you know, people that are listening may not know how it works, but can you explain how it works? Like, let's go through one of the programs that you have. What's the most popular one that people go through when they download the app? Um, so that'd be like, like the Calm Down program. Um, and then for Nerva, it's like similar, but it's just one program that goes over six weeks. Okay. And it's essentially... Um, like a series of six to eight sessions that you listen to um, that each target um, a different coping mechanism, a different skill and teaches you that. And so you, you go through each session, some might, more, might resonate more with you, some uh, might resonate less with you, but going through those and like learning those skills can help give you uh, a sense of like internal uh, control and self-regulation skills that can help you manage, manage your mental health or manage your IBS in, in a certain way. Mm, okay. Um, what is the next step for mindset now? What's coming up next? Are you coming up with a new app or is just improving the existing ones? So our, our next step is to get the, the playbook of um, building, building this single app condition, sing, single condition app, um, scaling it, getting it to product market fit um, or signs of product market fit and then replicating it with another program. And so our next program will be um, relating to chronic pain. Um, and oh, so we want to essentially, yeah, which affects, this is massive, right? 
20% of the population suffer from a type of chronic pain. Um, it's driven the opioid crisis in the US. There's a big issue there and a lot of people are looking for non-opioid pain management. And there's a huge amount of evidence supporting hypnosis as reducing pain and changing your perception of pain. And so that's our next program and we're hope launching that um, early next year. And then after that, it's raising our Series A. So we've, we've done our seed round um, end of last year. Then uh, mid next year, we want to raise a, a larger round to help take us from these three out, three three programs to 10 programs or whatever number it is and get us towards reimbursement and get us more evidence. We're like hopefully running a study into Nerva and um, building that evidence base to help us get towards more healthcare practitioners, more coverage from insurers and self-insured employers in the States. And it, is it a coincidence that you're always working with uh, researchers and academics from Monash University or do you have a partnership there? So Dr. Yatko actually from Mindset is, is not from Monash. So he, oh, he's okay. based um, in, in California. Oh, and okay. so he's just like a world leading expert in um, hypnosis. He actually writes the textbook on clinical uses of hypnosis, but um, also in depression and mental health. Um, with Monash, the Monash link is Monash is the, the world leader in IBS research. They yeah. developed the low FODMAP diet. And so, and because we went through the Monash accelerator, we both attended Monash university. The link there is super strong, mm -hmm. um, but maybe for our next program, we'll have a different, um, different researcher. But I think the, 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 the common thread between all this is we want to build an evidence based business that we work with world leading researchers um, and to take their research and help productize it and deliver it to millions of people. Okay. Let me see if anyone has a question. Would anyone attending would like to ask a question to Alex? Happy for you to post something in the chat box and I'll keep looking. Okay. Um, Alex, um, do you see yourself um, in this space 10, 20 years from now? Do you think that that's the, the space that you want to be operating in? Do you, do you think that that's um, uh, going to be the future for you? as opposed to dresses <laughs> <laughs> definitely definitely as someone who like as i said like suffer from anxiety um and has i have celiac disease so i have a gut um, chronic gut condition um this is a so you're basically of... building all these apps for you <laughs> exactly yeah yeah like i wish even if ever could help with celiac um my stomach lining attacks itself but i i think like having that empathy for the consumer and having uh, for the user and like it's something I've, I've been working on this for the rest of my life would be like building a, a Pfizer $200 billion like company for helping people like manage their conditions themselves um, is, is, is super exciting. And I, I would not wish to not work on it for the next 10 years. Um, yeah. And what do you think about being based in Australia? Do you think that that's viable? It, it, it's for a digital product it shouldn't matter is our, our thesis like we we sell to our us is the biggest market and we're not based there and so it doesn't matter there is some um interest from investors just being near them so they can meet with you and attend board meetings and stuff like that and so that's probably the bigger hurdle but for us there's there's a huge uh, there's a huge benefit to be bang, being based in australia our family are here we can um, get employees much more affordably. The cost of living is much cheaper than working in San Francisco. So I, I think the benefits outweigh the, the cost, but there is definitely a cost. Yeah. All right. I think that's it for us. I think we've done a great session here. Thank you so much for your time. And you have been a fantastic guest. We, um, don't have any sort of big questions from the attendees. Everybody's saying, thank you, impressive story, great session. Um, they asked about the, um, uh, the Mindset Health um, URL. So I put all the links in the chat box for everyone. And I will, of course, add it to the episode show notes as well. So Alex, thank you so much. And I hope that very soon I will come and visit you at your new office when you're able to go and use it. <laughs> have you furnished it? Is it? Does it have desks and tables and everything? It's just empty. Yeah, it's all, it's all furnished. We had a brief period that we worked there when the lockdown ended and then it restarted um, where people work together. So it's all furnished. We're just waiting to get back there.
No, oh, okay. I'll come and visit you one day and we'll have a coffee. <laughs> Sounds good, Renata. <laughs> Bye, Alex. Thanks for your time. Bye. No Bye. worries. Thanks for having Bye, me. Bye, everybody. I hope you found this episode useful and that it helps your job hunting and career plans. Don't forget to subscribe and follow me on social media and on your favorite podcast app. And please join the Reset Your Career community so I can send you free tools and resources to make your career advancement more successful. See you next time.